In the morning hours of May 19th, 2012, along the beach and amongst the dunes on Sunset Beach, Port Ricardo, New Zealand, a local was taking a leisurely stroll with her dog. Like many mornings before, the stroll was relatively uneventful, waves crashing about the shoreline while the dog enjoyed the open space and ocean breeze, free to roam as they desired. However, on this morning, things would take an interesting turn when the dog found something buried in the sand. Thinking the dog had located a dead animal or some type of decaying sea creature, the local went to investigate, only to find the remains of a human body. They immediately called police and an investigation began to ensue. Most important to the local authorities was to identify the remains. Detectives made sure not to disturb the area too much or let reporters through, trying to preserve valuable forensic evidence. It wasn't all that uncommon to find bodies washed on the shore. In fact, hundreds of people go missing in New Zealand each year. Some perhaps swimming and may have been caught in the tide or others intending to end their lives eventually would wash up on shore. This, however, seemed different to detectives. The remains were skeletal, a skull protruding, followed by the rest of the body. Some decayed articles of clothing lay nearby as well. When the emergency 911 went over the radio, young enthusiastic reporters wanted to be the first on the scene. Speculation grew as to whose body it was, but most would never imagine the identity belonged to a woman that went missing 20 years before. Thanks to DNA evidence, investigators were quick to discover the remains belonged to 17-year-old Jane Furlong, a teenager who went missing on May 26, 1993. Her strange and sudden disappearance troubled the local community and authorities for almost two decades, with no one knowing where the teen had gone. It appeared that she had been buried deep within the dunes on Sunset Beach, and over time, the wind and rain eroded the sand away to reveal the corpse, almost two decades to the day she went missing. Police had always suspected some sort of foul play, but without a body, were never able to verify that. With the discovery of Jane's remains, the police were almost certainly looking for a murderer, and the investigation to follow would lead down a list of suspects and rabbit holes that to this day leave us all without an answer as to who killed Jane Furlong. According to those around her and her precious diary, Jane had had a rough go at life from the start. Coming from a family of five, her home situation deteriorated with her father leaving their mother empty-handed, but away from his toxic presence. Jane and her siblings were sent to foster care, against her mother's wishes, but was considered what was best for the children. It was supposed to be a short stint, but ended up being a stretch of over seven years. She was then enrolled in boarding school, which was considered a good move, and while Jane excelled in school, it wasn't her primary interest. She made friends easy, but often would get into trouble experimenting with drugs and alcohol as well as petty crimes like shoplifting. Jane had admitted to a best friend that at one point in her foster care, she had been molested, but claimed it was her fault, adopting a common victim trait by blaming herself, when she was clearly taken advantage of. By 17, Jane had been expelled from boarding school, and decided the next step was to find steady employment and she did just that. Just prior to his sudden disappearance, Jane had been working as a sex worker, just south of Auckland on her usual street of Karangahaip Road, also sometimes known as K Road, the same place she was last seen. K Road is often described as a seedy area with bars and clubs lining the street, similar to Oxford Street in London in the early 1920s. It was a common area for sex workers looking for jobs and known for its rowdiness at times. Jane had been with her partner, Danny Norsworthy, for about two years, and just four months before her sudden disappearance, she had given birth to their son, Aiden. On the night of her disappearance, Jane had plans to go out with Danny and a friend, Amanda, who she had known and worked with for the last few years. She had confided in Amanda previously that she was considering leaving Danny, citing their relationship as volatile and difficult. Almost immediately after the birth of their son, the child went to live with Jane's mother, mainly in part to her and Danny's lifestyle and Jane being almost too young herself having to work constantly in her profession to keep herself afloat. Certainly not an ideal environment for a new baby. This upset Jane, but it was for the best, she expressed, as Danny could be violent at times, and the couple argued frequently. On top of all that, the 17-year-old was to be a witness at several upcoming trials, and the pressure was getting increasingly more difficult for her to deal with as the prosecutors came to her house, calling her at all hours, and even ringing her at her mother's house. Jane had mentioned to her mother in the past that she was concerned about the trial, the only time she had let her guard down and expressed truly being afraid about the consequences of testifying. The case that seemed to concern Jane the most was of a local businessman, who had been accused of being violent and abusive to sex workers on K Road. When the story broke, the press had a field day. Jane was one of the few witnesses who agreed to testify as she had run in the previous year with the suspect, who left her quite traumatized. She now carried a knife with her when she went down to K Road, and especially when she was working. 
This made Jane feel safe, and the fear of being assaulted again seemed to be a fleeting one, as she continued to work on K Road night after night. Danny, Amanda, and Jane had been dropped off in front of a department store, Rendell's, to start their evening shift. Danny usually hung around while the girls looked for work so he could take down the license plates of the patrons, just an added security measure to keep Jane safe. Danny had not always been a fan of Jane's line of work, but was never successful at having her give it up. On this particular night, however, Danny had an issue with his own vehicle, parked a few miles away. It had broken down. He requested their usual cab driver, Chris Good, to help him tow it, and had brought a rope to get the job done. Jane and Amanda were on their own for the first part of the evening, but they weren't concerned. Amanda got a job first, hopping into a client's car and waving goodbye to Jane. Jane was usually always first to snag a patron, as her fiery red hair drew the gaze of interested men. Later that evening, Danny returned to Kate Road, successfully retrieving his broken down vehicle. Looking around, Jane was nowhere to be seen. Thinking she must have scored a job, he had the cab driver ferry him up and down K Road for the rest of the evening, running errands. In the wee hours of the morning, the cab driver drops Danny back off in front of Rendell's, where Jane and Amanda usually waited for clients. Jane, however, was still not back. Eventually, Amanda returned and had been looking for Jane, but no one else had seen her. Amanda thought perhaps Jane had opted to do an overnight with a client, but that would be out of the ordinary, and they also had plans to go out after, so something wasn't adding up. As the night went on, Danny became more concerned and felt it necessary to report Jane as missing. Given the short time since she was last seen in her profession, police weren't too concerned. Danny's concerns were met with eye rolls and advice that she was probably still working, or would show up in a few hours. Danny, still worried, kept looking for Jane in the following days. There had been times in the past where Jane had been picked up by clients and driven miles away where the client then robbed her and pushed her out of their vehicle. Maybe Jane was making her way back from being kicked out of a car or had decided halfway through she needed to leave and began walking. Given last year's encounter, where she was assaulted, it could be possible. However, two days later, Danny returned to the police station to once again report Jane missing, and this time the police gave more concern. First on the list was tracing her last steps. Naturally, Danny was a person of interest, one of the last people to see his girlfriend, and Amanda as well, being a close co-worker. However, the police began to focus more on Chris Good, the cab driver that had been friends with the trio and had shuttled Danny around that evening. Chris had met Jane and Danny a few years prior to that fateful evening. Good allowed some of his clients to rack up a tab, and this worked well for Danny and Jane, mainly because Danny was unemployed and Jane's income was fairly inconsistent, some nights better than others, some nights nothing at all. Good walked through his timeline with police and even drove the route with them and a reporter to show them he was simply doing his job that evening. To detectives, a few things stood out. Most of the time, Danny would walk between the different stops when he was running errands, but that evening, he racked up a $20 bill being chauffeured by Good between seedy motels and dive bars, a nice chunk of change for someone who wasn't employed. It's never made clear what specific errands Danny was running, but Good just sat outside while the meter was running and didn't question it. He felt everyone was just trying to make a buck and didn't look down on people's life choices. However, Good noted that the car they had towed earlier that evening was now gone when he returned from a dispatch after dropping Danny at Rendell's. It made him question what was wrong with the car anyway, and why it even needed a tow if it was now gone, along with Danny. Making matters worse for Good, the day after Jane went missing, his mother had passed away. He called off work and headed back north where she lived to get everything situated and say his goodbyes. Police thought it was highly suspicious that Jane's usual cab driver had gone AWOL just hours after her disappearance. In the end, however, there was little to no proof of Good having anything to do with Jane's disappearance. His statement added up, and they were satisfied he had nothing to do with it. Good reflects often on his time on K Road and his nights with Jane and the others. He felt sorry for Jane, just the 17-year-old girl trying to figure out her life. He was even concerned for her with the upcoming court cases and her working on the street. He often questioned police actions and why they didn't pull her off the street and keep her safe, knowing she was set to testify on a dangerous criminal who was known to beat and assault sex workers. This dangerous criminal in question was apprehended a few months before Jane had disappeared, but his identity was unknown to the public due to privacy laws in New Zealand. It wasn't until June of 1993 that Stephen Colley was named as the suspect who had assaulted several prostitutes over a several-month-long period. Stephen Colley was the son of a well-known businessman, Melvin Colley, who had founded several companies in and around Auckland. Collie was a family man, being married for 19 years and having three children. There were different versions of Stephen Collie depending on who you talked to. Most of his family said he excelled in his work, 
always coming up with new ideas and picking the right people for the job, but always struggled with the paperwork. They said his father had been a very tough parent, leaving lots to be desired, with his mother saying he was, quote, highly anxious, nervy, and highly strung, end quote. Kali's main argument in his defense against the accusing sex workers was that they were mistaken. His defense was baking on the woman being incorrect or inconsistent with their testimony, but he was still scared when it came to his meetings with his attorneys. In one such meeting, a private investigator was helping Kali in trying to get the accusations discredited. Kali had built up a relationship with the investigator, but it was soured when he asked if there was anything they could do about the woman set to testify. In so many words, Kali was suggesting to get rid of them somehow, by any means. The investigator, being a former police officer, did not take this lightly, seeing it as a sign of guiltiness and immediately filed a police report. This charge eventually got Kali wrapped up further into legal trouble, spending all his funds on the court cases and was remanded without bail until his upcoming trial. One month after his bail was remanded, Jane had disappeared from the spot he had picked her up at just one year prior. Speculation weighed heavily on Kali, being accused of several violent interactions with sex workers and trying to suggest some way to make them all disappear. When Jane disappeared, there were a lot of eyes in his direction. However, how could a man who sat in jail be responsible for making a girl disappear? Despite Jane's line of work and the typical response to cases similar when it came to missing or murdered sex workers, there was media coverage about her disappearance. Days after she went missing, the front page of the paper featured her photo about her missing off Kate Road. Billboards popped up all around with the same photo of Jane, asking for any information that could help find her. The TV show, 60 Minutes, was filming a segment about Kay Road, but it quickly turned into finding out about what happened to Jane, a much more interesting story. When they began filming, they had managed to even catch Jane on camera a month before she disappeared. They interviewed Amanda and Danny, both saying they feared Jane to be dead, but held out hope she was still alive. Ironically, Jane's case had been featured on an episode of Crime Watch months prior. Jane had been interviewed for an episode of Crime Watch in regard to Stephen Colley before he was apprehended. Soon, however, the media seemed to start suggesting that maybe Jane really did disappear, perhaps due to the turbulent relationship she had with Danny, perhaps because she couldn't handle the newfound responsibility of motherhood. There were suggestions that clothes had been missing from the flat she shared with Danny, and that she returned for them before she absconded. Life seemed to move on for those close to Jane, with no answers ever coming in regard to her sudden disappearance. Amanda continued her work on K Road for several years later. Danny moved on as well, finding odd jobs and settling into new relationships. Jane's mother, Judith, had to move on too, struggling each day to go to work, but knowing that there was no other option until Jane was found. She was caring for Jane's son and had a mortgage. She held on to the idea that Jane would be back someday. Hopefully. Even with the discovery of Jane's body in 2012, police had little to nothing to go on. Their best suspect, Chris Good, the cab driver, and Danny Norsworthy, Jane's ex, had both been cleared as suspects shortly after Jane had disappeared. Chris Good was happy to go over his statement from 1994 with police again, but never strayed from it, stating he knew better to go in off sheer memory alone, fearing the police would try to use his own words against him. Danny refused to speak with the media and was never able to offer anything more to detectives inquiring about Jane's murder. Chris Good felt that Danny had nothing to hide, and that he would never hurt Jane. Jane's mother felt the same, knowing the two had their issues, but Danny had always supported Jane, and they shared a son together. A funeral was held a few months later, with everyone in Jane's past in attendance. Judith, Danny, Amanda, and Chris, all present to lay Jane to rest. It was a somber event, with most not wishing to attend, but feeling they had to. Danny had mentioned it felt strange to bury an ex-girlfriend, especially after so many years. Police also learned that in May of 1993, there had been restoration on Sunset Beach to preserve the dunes. Jane's body had been buried not far from the surf club parking lot, suggesting perhaps they didn't try too hard to bury the body, or maybe they were too high or too drunk to hide it better. Due to the restoration, heavy equipment was used to pile sand on the dunes. Unknowingly, they were covering Jane's body with heaps of sand, where she would remain for two decades. Perhaps without this coincidental timing, Jane's body could have been found sooner, Maybe a suspect could have been identified or evidence procured sooner, but the search for a killer would not end, even after finding Jane. One strange bit did come to light when a man saw a taping of the show Sensing Murder in 2007, roughly 14 years after Jane's disappearance. Dean Sutherland, known for his work with the band Satellite Spies, had sparked up a conversation with Jane the night she went missing. 
When he saw her case on the TV all those years later, the hairs on the back of his neck stood up. Dean had struck up this conversation with Jane off Kate Road. His other band, X-Rated, was in town for a gig the next night, and had asked Jane what she was doing. Standoffish at first, Jane was at ease when he told her he was a musician. The two went back and forth, with Dean inviting her to a show the next day and giving her a demo. Before they could finish the conversation, an American-styled car pulled up, and Jade said she had to run. The car sat idling for a minute, and an argument could be heard. The musician tapped on the window and asked Jane if everything was okay, to which Jane replied, quote, It's fine. I can handle this one. End quote. And just like that, the man didn't think about the interaction for almost 14 years. Dean sought to inform police about the interaction, but due to the passing of time, it didn't go very far. The information, though, is interesting when it's compared to other witness statements on or around May 27, 1993. On that day specifically, a man and his wife were at Sunset Beach when a car pulled up and stared at the couple suspiciously. The witness, who remains unnamed, said there were in total about six people, none of them looking happy, especially the lone female of the group. The couple felt something was off, but stayed for a while before leaving, as the man was late for work. In the weeks following, after learning about the missing woman, the man tried to reach out to the police, but for some reason his account seemed to fall short. The man throughout the years has recalled the incident to whoever would listen, but as it usually goes with the passing of time, the account loses its value, with little to go on. However, one important tidbit from his account is that he specifically recalls the car being American-made, quite possibly blue in color, most likely a blue Chevy Caprice. When we take this account and Dean Sutherland's account into question, we can begin to make some connections. When the car pulls up and interrupts Jane's interaction with Dean Sutherland, he recalls that she seems to know the man in the vehicle, even arguing with the driver. Dean says the car is American-made, just like the witness at Sunset Beach the following day. Chris Good, the cab driver, recalls helping Danny tow his blue Chevy Caprice the night Jane went missing, but after dropping Danny off and returning hours later, it wasn't in the spot they left it outside Rendell's. Where did the car go? And why did it need a tow if it was able to be driven? Danny was never able to explain what had happened to the car that night, saying he didn't know where it went or who moved it. However, this doesn't necessarily put the target on Danny as being responsible in Jane's death. Though several things are off with the night in question, like Danny not taking down the license plates of Jane's clients, the towing of the vehicle, and then Danny being chauffeured around rather than returning to his usual post or walking, those around him have defended his innocence. Amanda, Jane's best friend, and Judith, Jane's mother, both didn't think Danny was responsible or capable of killing Jane, and they are steadfast that he loved her, even until the day he died. While Danny and Jane's relationship was somewhat toxic and chaotic, Danny expressed it as the only love he had ever known, but never realized it until she was gone. He was heavily investigated from the start and periodically interrogated throughout the years, but it never deterred him from speaking his truth. He attended the ceremony when Jane was found and rekindled his relationships with the people he knew through Jane, even erecting a cross in the spot she was found. Weeks after Jane went missing, Danny, soaked from the pouring rain, knocked and collapsed at Judith's doorstep with a picture of Jane, stating that she was all he had, before sobbing his way back into the night. These aren't necessarily the actions of a guilty man, but perhaps maybe a man who knew something more. Regrettably, however, Danny went to his grave in March of 2022, stating he had given investigators everything he knew about the case to them back in 1993. The connections are odd and scattered, but when you take a look at the accounts from several different sources and piece them together, a bigger picture begins to appear. This is where the name Wayne Michael McGrath comes into the fold. Wayne was an associate of Danny, with the two living together for a few months in a shared flat outside of Auckland, not far from K Road in the early 90s. Jane and Amanda naturally found themselves at the flat hanging out or partying while under some sort of substance. It was at one of the parties that Wayne McGrath barricaded 15-year-old Amanda in his room and raped her. Unable to escape until the morning, she called Jane for help and had to be pulled from McGrath's clutches. Shortly after this encounter, McGrath realized he was missing $1,200, and began to assault and threaten everyone inside the flat, shoving, punching, and pushing people, accusing them of stealing his money. The blame was pointed primarily at Amanda since she was in the room all night and despite witnessing it all, Danny did nothing to stop the abuse or the rape. McGrath was described as a bigger man with dead eyes and anger issues. The trio of Danny, Amanda, and Jane stopped hanging out with McGrath after the altercation, only seeing him in passing, with only Danny still interacting with him from time to time. It wasn't until 2015 when Amanda reported the rape and McGrath stood at trial defending himself. 
Parts of Jane's diary were used in his conviction, and he was sentenced to five years and four months in prison. During his testimony, McGrath accused Amanda of making it all up because she couldn't, quote, pin the whole Jane thing on me, end quote. McGrath said he last saw Jane two weeks before she went missing. However, three months prior to her disappearance, the trio were involved in another altercation with McGrath. Before Danny had the Chevy Caprice, he was driving a V8 Commodore. He hadn't had the car long before it was stolen. The car was brand new, but the exact details of its theft changed with who was telling the story. The car had been given to Danny by McGrath, but McGrath says he loaned the car to Danny and he was expected to be paying him back. When Danny failed to pay McGrath for the vehicle, an associate of McGrath stole it on his orders. The saga of the stolen vehicle came to a head when the trio tracked the car to a warehouse in West Auckland, where accusations were tossed around. There were loads of people there and Jane was screaming at McGrath as to where her car was. The situation heated up when McGrath or an associate pointed a loaded crossbow at Danny and then at Jane, before the crowd scattered and police showed up. Danny and Amanda didn't want to say anything, but Jane was pissed and gave a statement to police. The case was set to go to trial, and this was the second case where Jane was set to testify, most likely against McGrath, until she mysteriously vanished. To point the finger even more towards McGrath or one of his associates, his family owned property near Port Ricardo and he was familiar with the area where Jane's remains were found. McGrath has stated himself that he is a suspect in Jane's disappearance, though there is no evidence to tie him to the case. However, the chain of events in the months leading up to Jane's disappearance certainly point in his direction. Could the pending court order against McGrath give him enough reason to end Jane's life? The location of her body wasn't exactly inconspicuous, and there would have been much better, more secluded places to dump a body. This suggests that whoever drove her all the way out there had to be comfortable with the location. Perhaps the car witnessed by Sutherland and the man on the beach was the Caprice, or even the Commodore, and perhaps it was McGrath and his posse inside. Perhaps McGrath was so mad at Jane for not only being a thorn in his side, present when his money was stolen, and getting him in trouble with the law, he decided to get rid of her. Or maybe the intention was to hurt Danny, who had gotten McGrath in trouble over the Commodore. McGrath is currently a free man being released from prison in 2019 after serving his full sentence for the rape of Amanda in the early 1990s. There are some other suspects police have looked at, but are unable to confirm any involvement in the case. In 1996, Amanda was kidnapped and raped by Hayden Taylor. Shortly after the rape, Taylor was freed on bail and then murdered a young pregnant girl. He was sentenced to life in prison and remains there in parts thanks to Amanda showing up at every single one of his parole hearings, just like she did with McGrath's. Taylor was looked at for Jane's disappearance given his criminal past, proximity to the area, and the assault on Jane's former best friend. But he proclaims his innocence, and there is no evidence to support his involvement. In 1996, spree killer Hayden Poulter wrote to a newspaper saying, quote, That bitch in 93 was the best, end quote, most likely referring to Jane. Police were quick to disclude his confession saying the M.O. didn't match. Poulter was paroled in 2018, but was shortly remanded back to prison, where he died by suicide about a month later. Besides random confessions and spotty detective work on witness statements, the inquiry into Jane's murder has all but stalled. It would seem that in order to really come to some form of closure, a confession would be needed. Whose confession that may be is up in the air. This is one of, if not the most famous cold case in New Zealand, and for all those involved, they continue to hold on, waiting for something to point them in the right direction. It's Polygraph's belief that this case is very solvable, but more information is needed to tie the pieces together. It has been 30 years since she was last seen on K Road, and 12 since she was found buried in the dunes. If you or anyone you know has information that could lead to an arrest or identification to Jane Furlong's murder, please submit a tip to Crime Stoppers at crimestopper-nz.org. Until then, Polygraph investigates.